I'm Bob Cusack, Editor-in-Chief of The Hill. Thank you for joining us for our program today, Prescription for Change, Improving Competition to Lower Drug Prices. I'd like to thank PCMA, the Pharmaceutical Care Management Association, for sponsoring today's show. Rising prescription drug prices are a major concern for many Americans. One in four patients in the U.S. face financial challenges affording their medications, and three in 10 Americans say they did not take medications as prescribed due to cost, according to a 2022 Kaiser Family Foundation report. One remedy to high prices may be to increase access to biologics. These complex medicines derived from living organisms don't have traditional generic versions. Biosimilars are designed to provide a nearly identical product in the marketplace and within a few years at a lower price. What is the future of biosimilars? Would patent reform increase biosimilar competition and lower prices? And how can we bring down prices while also encouraging medical innovation? We will answer those questions and many more in today's program. Before we get underway, you can tweet us at at the Hill events using the hashtag, hashtag the Hill Health. Our first guest is Congressman David Schweikert from Arizona, the chairman of the House Ways and Means Oversight Committee and the co-chair of the Telehealth Caucus. I sat down with him yesterday. Take a listen. Congressman Schweiker, thanks for joining us today. Um, thank you for having me. I first want to ask you about the mood in the House Republican Conference. We have seen a uh, historic uh, speaker vote, and the party was not united. You supported Kevin McCarthy from the beginning. Uh, now it's months later. Uh, what is the mood in the House GOP conference? Um, I think for many members, they did not have in their head how hard they were going to work. Hmm. You know, in an environment with open rules, where you actually get to do this crazy thing of trying to legislate. And, and this goes both for my brothers and sisters on the left and those who buzz you know, on the right. The previous four years, we functionally were um, ornamental. And, and so I actually see just the pace and the rhythm being wonderfully healthy because um, uh, there, there really is something that concept of when you're you're busy and you're able to chase your ideas and try to legislate. Um, there's something very fulfilling and, and rewarding in being able to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, now that you're in, in the majority, you have the gavel. Uh, you're on the House Ways and Means Committee. You're, you're heading the oversight panel. What's the agenda for the for the committee? Everything. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trying. I don't want to be. Um, you, you do have a vast jurisdiction. I do. Uh, yeah, I will give you that. And, and there becomes um, intellectually just your head spins. Um, the jurisdiction of the Ways and Means Committee, when you start to think about I have trade, I have Medicare, I have the unemployment fraud, um, I have Social Security, I have you know uh, Medicare itself and its financing mechanisms. You have debt. You, know, you have so many things. And every single one of them is absolutely important. So how do you build a structure where it's not only on things where you, you really need to drill down and sometimes be a little bit brutal, you know, understanding where you believe the administration, our, our treasuries, our, the IRS um, failed their statutory obligations, down to just understanding policy. And did we as members of Congress fail to design something properly? So we've tried to create sort of a three-tier model of here's where we do correspondence. <clears throat> and we've even had a couple of our Democrat colleagues say, I really want to know about this. And we'll do a letter to that agency, to IRS, to Treasury, to others saying, can you walk us through how this is being interpreted and how you believe it is in sync with what Congress's intent was? Some were actually starting to organize roundtables where you may have um, – you're not going to have a stenographer there. It's about understanding. And so that's a little less head crashing, you know, the formality of I'm going to get my five minutes an answering a got you question. But many of the things in ways and means we deal with are stunningly complex. Mm -hmm. And then obviously the traditional hearing model. And so we're trying to do all that at the same time. Mm -hmm. 
I, you know, 20 years ago, when I came to the Hill as a healthcare reporter, I, I reported on the creation of Part D. It wasn't easy uh, to, for Republicans to get that over the finish line, uh, but it, by and large, it's been successful. But of course, uh, the issue has not faded uh, and, and people still want to get the price of prescription drugs down. What do you think are some of the solutions that the Congress mm-hmm. and maybe the administration could do? Um I have actually a, and I may be an outlier, I have a somewhat um, aggressive view on what you could do to um, improve the pricing structure of pharmaceuticals. But you have to be willing to, give me 90 seconds here. Sure, sure. The majority of what we consume is now off patent. Humira, the most expensive drug from the previous decade, is now off patent. Um, a number of the A1Cs and other things that may be um, incredibly powerful in helping people mitigate issues in the pre-diabetic. And these are functionally soon to be off patent. We know in some of the literature we've been tracking in our office that there's some revolutions in everything from how you manufacture small molecule to other types. Um, think of uh, one example, um, a picture rooms full of super high speed 3D printers. Mm-hmm that print pharmaceuticals. So you no longer need a $200 million facility. You now need something a fraction of the cost and you're using technology to compete. Um, How do I get every potential company that has an interest into the manufacturing business? How do I almost flood the market with competition? And then there's the next outliers. Um, Things like the uh, insulin co-op that's being built in Virginia that actually I think comes online next year that has made it very clear um, that co-op is made up of Medicaid systems, insurance companies, hospitals. They will functionally also, I mean, we know what Pfizer and some of the others have done, but the price they were going to do from the co-op, their list price was even lower than the subsidized price. That we were gonna spend what, $36 billion subsidizing big pharma. The very people that we attack we're going to subsidize them to lower the price instead of a model where the primary eight types of insulin are already off patent. How do I get multiple competitors to manufacture? So our model is very much of, could I get regulatory tax, depreciation, other types of incentives to make a much more robust, a much more dynamic? And then you have to say some things that are heresy. And these are the things that get you in trouble is, Okay, I'm, I will require calcium inhibitors the rest of my life. I have high blood pressure. Same prescription, incredibly cheap. Why can't I just buy it from the manufacturer? Mm-hmm. So, so even the disruption of, the, of how, you know, the direct consumer markets with lots of manufacturers, it's a very different model than the left keeps giving us, which is a sort of scarcity price control model. And you already see the economic literature says, even though CBO has given it some positive scores, almost every other economist who's looked at it says just the opposite. It will create scarcity and particularly scarcity of the next set of cures. Uh, are you specifically talking about the Inflation Reduction Act uh, uh, drug pricing provisions? Yeah, and if or, or e- even its model, um, we're told that the budget, so I may be jumping ahead of us, um, we are going to see very shortly here coming from the White House, we'll have another variation of of. Um, price management, um, you know, mandatory um, uh, negotiations with a fixed price, but even go back to what was it, HR3 from Mm -hmm. what was a year or two ago, where Mm -hmm. the model made it very clear that a lot of cures were going to disappear just because you've blown up the financing stack. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you're talking about, let's talk about the growth of generics and biosimilars, Uh, you know, where has it been and where do you think it needs to go over the next five years? And, and is that a you know, big part of the solution? Um, whether you know it or not, that's a brilliant question. And it's <laughs> Thank a, you. <laughs> no, no, it, but it's also a surprisingly complex one. And that's actually one of the examples we're doing around the round table. If you read some of the literature, and, and we subscribe to a lot of crazy things, um, the company out of Boston that believes it's actually now cured a handful of people of type one diabetes. Okay. You know, it's a stem cell and now they're waiting for FDA to give them permission to do their next phase one, which will be with CRISPR uh, tagging the stem cells so your body doesn't need anti-rejection drugs. 
the miracle of, <clears throat> of that conceptually, let's say it's real. You could actually build the biofoundry model where you can do a production line. It, it would be your everyone with diabetes, even theoretically type twos. So now also, if you have some of the new drug categories that actually odd, crazy thing, part of it is it has a shorter patent than you might think because it's been around longer that you see people using for weight reduction. Could you actually build a model where um, we're going to fix parts of the farm bill? We're going to work with those who are type two diabetics to help them manage their weight. We're going to actually incentivize things like that Apple technology. It looks like it can do blood glucose right through your, your skin calculations. And then the holy grail of possibly curing people who islet cells no longer produce insulin. The crazy part of this discussion is diabetes is 33% of all healthcare, 31% mm -hmm. of all Medicare. It would be the single biggest thing you could do for US sovereign debt. So now when you have that conversation is part of the disruption of productivity in the society, um, labor force participation, income inequality, could it possibly come through cures through that healthcare stack? And and what about the you know the role of innovation? Because some people say if if you're making too many changes, and obviously, and and I, I'd, I'd also like you to talk about the role of stakeholders, because as you know, a lot a lot of times in healthcare, it's provider versus provider, and it's oh, tough yeah. to get anything done. You mentioned you, you get in trouble when you say this or that, mm -hmm. and and that that is the case uh, where you can get a backlash. <laughs> Look. Um, we have to deal, and, I, and, I, and I'm going to get in, I'm truly going to get in trouble how I say this, but, but we have to be intellectually honest with each other. Much of what Congress has done the last couple of decades is designing legislation saying, this is what we're going to reimburse. This is how we want something to be patented or licensed. This is, we've almost created um, a structure that disincentivizes true levels of competition. We're, we're bordering on being a protection racket, you know, um, uh, for incumbency, not incumbent members of Congress, but incumbent business models, incumbent bureaucracies. And the budget situation is much, much worse than almost anyone can process. When you think in nine budget years, you can wipe out all of discretionary, military included, all discretionary, and you still have to borrow a couple hundred billion dollars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the primary driver of all future debt over the next 30 years is healthcare. And maybe eventually it's, it's got to be tackled, right? One way or the other. So, so maybe it's time we have an honest conversation with our brothers and sisters on K Street and industry and this and that saying, you got a choice. We're going to double your taxes over the next 20 plus years. And that's what CBO's numbers say. Mm -hmm. Or we need to basically go to the moment of hyper disruption. But the hyper disruption is incredibly moral because it would be about curing people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you're a leader on the, in the telehealth caucus, and obviously we've seen massive jumps in, in telehealth during COVID. Uh, how, how does telehealth fit into the, the issue of drug pricing and, and, and getting better quality of life for people? It, it's a brilliant. Uh, I like it because you know what a war telehealth was. Mm -hmm. Before the pandemic, I had a piece of legislation year after year after year and was repeatedly told I was never going to get a hearing, it, the lobbying against it, because it disrupted business models. Right. You know, let's be honest. So how do I take you from thinking that FaceTime on your phone is telehealth to the moment of what you can wear on your wrist, mm -hmm. what you blow into, what you lick, what you can urinate on? I mean, let's be honest. What What happens when... The flu kazoo, the thing you blow into that looks like a large kazoo that tells you you have the flu and the algorithm orders your antivirals. That technology has existed for five years now. But function because we don't reimburse it because Social Security Act says you will see a doctor because of state licensures at the pharmaceutical level and, and who can write a script. What would happen if you and I, vision, our vision is telehealth is much more than I'm having a FaceTime. It may be the avatar driven by chat GPT in two years. Mm -hmm. And if we can prove it statistically accurate and you can insure it, which you already insure diabetic pumps, and that's an algorithm prescribing someone. Think about it. You know, so, you know someone, 
you know, when their blood glucose moves and their little, their pump it's attached to them, it's dosing them. That's an algorithm that's dosing, that's prescribing. And it obviously has insurance. So it already exists in our, our, our medical world. Is that ultimate future of telehealth? And in many ways, is it still telehealth or is it basically the adoption of t- technology to keep us healthy, but also disrupt the price of healthcare? Last question, are you, are you optimistic? Uh, you know, we, we have divided government. We're living in polarizing times. Uh, do you think, and we got, a, of course, another election coming up, as always, uh, presidential this time. Do you think this Congress, divided Congress, uh, with, a, with a Democrat in the White House can, can get something done uh, significantly on drug pricing or healthcare in general? Um, well, let's see. I'm 61 years old and I have an eight-month-old, so I'm obviously pathologically optimistic. <laughs> I'm becoming more optimistic because I think there's a reality that the budget numbers are so ugly. There is no mathematical way to cut or tax your way and make the numbers work. You know, mm-hmm. we, we functionally li- have lied to ourselves for decades and, it, and, it's, and it's demographics. We got old. So the path needs to be another rail. And I'm going to argue that new third rail, which isn't the one you step on and electrocute yourself, it actually is Republicans, Democrats legalizing technology, legalizing um, um, the things that, that, that create mass competition, and then a fixation on something like diabetes, where at the end of the decade, we've bent the curve substantially and we can see it in our spending and borrowing. Well, you certainly have a, a big agenda on the Ways and Means Committee and should be an interesting congr- uh, Congress and uh, enjoyed the, the conversation. And, and uh, we hope to have you again on soon. You're very kind. There is strong public support for the government to address high and rising drug prices. Minnesota Senator Tina Smith, a member of the Senate Help Committee, joins me now to share her thoughts on this front. Welcome, Senator. Thank you. It's wonderful to be with you. Well, you have been laser focused on this issue. Actually, the first bill you introduced dealt with uh, prescription drug pricing. So, you know, you know, big picture, what, do you, what has worked in the past and, and what needs to be done in the future? Well, so I start from the place that healthcare should be a right, not a privilege. And the understanding that I've picked up from so many Minnesotans that a lot of people struggle to pay for the prescriptions that in some cases they need to stay alive. I mean, the numbers are really, as you know, incredible. Um, Many people are rationing their medicine because they can't afford it. And at the same time, prescription drug prices are going up and up and up. I think they've tripled um, in the last chunk of time. So this is obviously a big problem that we have to solve. And that's why the first bill that I introduced was to go at how can you bring more competition um, and more price transparency um, into the prescription drug market in order to have consumers be able to afford the medicines that they need. Um, One thing that happens is that you have basically the big name brand um, drug companies kind of gaming the system. They have uh, patent protections and they game the system in order to protect those patents. And that allows them to protect their capacity to charge Americans many, many, many times higher prices than they get other places in the country. That's something that I think we should be able to go after and we should be able to fix. And there's bipartisan support for that. And are you optimistic, speaking of bipartisan support, you know, in, in passing any legislation, if you bet, a, bet that the bill is not going to make it, you're right 99 percent of the time. Uh, we are in divided government now. There has been some health care legislation in recent years, whether it's the Right to Try Act or the 21st uh, Century Cures Act, which actually was bipartisan. Obviously, the Affordable Care Act was, was not bipartisan. Um, but what do you think can be done and, and what is on the, the Senate Health Committee's agenda this Congress? Yeah, well, so a couple of observations. Uh, One is that the Senate Health Committee has traditionally worked in good, strong, bipartisan ways on, on, you know, some on prescription drugs and um, worked in bipartisan ways on mental health and supporting community health centers. So 
you know, you always have to look for that place where you can find common ground and you can you can reach some reach some accommodation. And many of the bills that I've introduced to uh, bring more competition into prescri prescription drug pricing are, are bipartisan bills. I've worked with uh, Senator Cassidy and Senator, who's now the ranking member of the Health Committee, and um, Senator Marshall and others. So, um, you know, I think you have to be optimistic. One other thing I'll just observe is that um, though the um, Inflation Reduction Act um, reforms that bring more competition to prescription drugs for seniors and are going to lower premiums um, for seniors and cap prescription drug costs for seniors, um, set the price of insulin at $35, uh, no higher if you are on Medicare. You know, that may not have gotten any Republican uh, votes in the Senate, but it's broadly bipartisan mm -hmm. um, out in the real world of uh, Minnesota and every pl other places in the country. Uh, what can we learn from other countries? Because in, in this country, we're, we're paying the highest drug prices, but that's not the case uh, across the globe. What, what do you think we could learn from, from others? Well, you know, what happens in the United States, because we have done, we just failed to do some basic things like um, uh, allow Medicare to negotiate for better drug prices, American consumers end up paying the premium um, and in, are in some ways subsidizing the more realistic and reasonable prices that um, folks around the world are paying. And, you know, there's often an argument made that what we're doing is we're paying for innovation and we are paying for research and development and to a certain extent um, of course we want to to, to a certain extent there's some there's like a fraction of truth in that of course we want to encourage innovation and um, and um, and new technology but the reality is that if you look at the budgets of these big prescription drug companies they're spending way more on marketing and sales and lobbying um, than they are on research and development. And lots of their research and development is already subsidized by American taxpayers through the NIH and other um, base research that we do in this country. So one thing I think that we can learn from other countries is, um, let's, let, is let's allow a broader uh, negotiation um, for prescription drug prices. We made some really important steps with the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, I'd like to see that go um, faster and be able to negotiate the prices down on more prescriptions um, more quickly. But even what we passed uh, just with Democrats will um, start to make a, an improvement. And of course, what happens is because Medicare is such a large market, um, lower prices in Medicare start to put downward pressure on prices across the board, even if you get your health insurance um, through private insurance or the ACA or um, other sources. Right. You know, the, the President Biden has said and, and highlighted uh, all that was done in the last Congress. And, and after a lot of fits and starts, there was a fair amount of legislation that surprisingly got through in an election year. I was skeptical that, that some of those bills would get through. They did. Uh, however, the messaging, some Democrats say, is not there, whether it's in drug pricing on, in, in the Inflation Reduction Act. Is it very important to, to remind people what Democrats did, because whether it's the transportation bill or the, the IRA, it does take time for it to get to consumers and, and that they feel the difference. But, but is that important over the next you know, year and a half before the next election to say, this is what we did and this is how it's going to make your life better? I think it's very important. And um, it's important, yes, one, because, you know, we want to win elections, to be, sure. you know, totally honest. <laughs> but it's beyond that because, um, you know, Americans need to be able to see and understand that their government is delivering results. It is solving the problems that they have asked us to solve. In a world where there is so much noise and there's also, honestly, so much misinformation, we have to do our work to make sure that people understand. And, um, you know, here's an example. Um, mm -hmm. With the Inflation Reduction Act, we put a $35 cap on insulin for people that are on Medicare. And we also said that all vaccines, if you're on Medicare, vaccines for the shingles or uh, for COVID or other vaccines are going to be free. Now, that is a really significant benefit 
for uh, folks on Medicare who struggle to pay for their prescription drugs, but it's going to take a while for them to feel it. They'll start to feel it, and then we need to do a much better job of communicating what that benefit is and helping them to understand, helping people to understand and connect the dots. And it's no shame on them. People have busy lives. They've got a lot going on, and um, it's hard to keep track of this, um, particularly when there is, um, as I said, you know, so much other news and so much happening in people's lives. Earlier, Senator, you mentioned lobbying, and there's a lot of lobbying uh, in health care, and I don't think lobbying is a bad thing. Teachers have lobbies and, and policemen have lobbies, but, but it's pretty intense uh, in the health care field, which I used to cover. What, what has surprised you about coming to Washington and trying to get stuff done amid the massive lobbying in health care where you know, providers sometimes uh, join up and, and, and back a bill, and a lot of times they're at odds with one another? Well, I think that um, you know, it's, it's a really interesting question because I will tell you that I know and, um, and, and trust and respect some of the folks that, um, that lobby for health plans or um, you know, you know, are, are, are in health care. And the best of them will give you full information, will tell you the pros and cons. And of course, you know that they have a point of view and that they're, um, you know, we know what they're trying to get done and that should be transparent and clear. But what happens is that you have big, powerful lobbies um, like pharma, for example, or like the gun lobby that kind of succeed in locking down um, the important policy changes that we need to make. And then it stymies progress and it frustrates Americans because they don't understand why we can't make the progress uh, that we that we need to make. Um, it, it doesn't it's, it's nonsensical to them. So you have to be willing and able to buck that and to do what you know are right for your constituents and not just what you are hearing from the folks downtown, as we say here in Washington, uh, who um, are also, you know, candidly, the folks that are making big financial contributions on the other side um, to um, legislators in order to have their ear and um, influence them. What, what can the administration do? You know, after a bill passes, there's there's implementation. We're seeing that with a number of bills. Um, but whether it's FDA or CMS, you know, FDA approves a drug, but then it's got to be reimbursed, and then there's patent. It's all very complicated. Uh, you know, I, I, I know a lot of consumers are just frustrated. They don't understand their health care bills. But what, what can the administration do? What do you want the administration, whether it's various agencies uh, on implementation of, of legislation or, or things that they could do to, to make quality of life better? Well, the reality is that the um, th we we all every day um, in my office are in close touch with the administration to keep an eye on how implementation is going, push them along um, if we don't feel that they're going fast enough, um, try to help them understand what impact this is having on people in Minnesota so that they can uh, be more responsive. Um, these are big, complicated federal agencies. And I mean, honestly, sometimes they get stuck in their ways. They have certain ways of doing things and they um, need a little push to be able to move along. I know from my conversations with the White House and with the president that he is determined, he is hell bent, for example, to make sure that the implementation of this um, uh, drug negotiation with Medicare, that it goes as quickly as possible. Frankly, we all would have liked to have done more than that, but we weren't able to get the votes for it. So I know, I think in his budget that he's gonna be announcing uh, uh, on Thursday today that uh, we expect him to be proposing additional reforms that will also make headway. So it's a process and it's not like you don't get everything done all at once, but you have to keep working on it and um, uh, be optimistic about what you can accomplish. Senator, last question. You mentioned the, the Inflation Reduction Act and, and obviously that was a, a trimmed down version of Build Back Better. If Democrats, and you mentioned the election, do well and then the House and Senate and White House are all up for grabs, but if Democrats were able to, to get everything, do you think and would you want Democrats to pick up some of the stuff that got on the, on the cutting room floor of Build Back Better and pursue that again uh, in a couple years? Absolutely. I mean, there. Here, here's here's a classic example. We were able to get through in the Inflation Reduction Act that cap on insulin at thirty-five dollars um, for people on Medicare. We wanted it to be a cap on insulin for everyone. Um, we were blocked by uh, from uh, including that in the legislation. Um, although we had bipartisan support, we had Republicans that voted for it, just not quite enough. More blocked it. That's a classic example of something that I'd like to uh, see us do and. 
you know, I just want to note also that um, even though we weren't able to accomplish that $35 insulin for everyone, you can already see the pressure that was um, that we are putting on big manufacturers like Lilly, who have announced that they're going to move their price uh, to that level um, as a, um, I think, a response to the um, outcry that people are, um, you know, the outcry that you see around insulin. Senator, Senator Smith, th thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate your perspective. Thank you so much. And now it's time for a word from the sponsor of today's event, PCMA, featuring PCMA President and CEO J.C. Scott. Have a listen. There are over 70 companies providing pharmacy benefit services in the United States, serving over 270 million Americans today. Pharmacy benefit companies provide specialized expertise to help employers, unions, and other plan sponsors navigate the prescription drug benefit and to bring down costs through negotiations against big drug companies and negotiations with pharmacies for higher quality and lower cost. If you have health insurance coverage, the odds are that you have a pharmacy benefit company working on your behalf. I'm JC Scott, and I'm president and CEO of PCMA, the National Trade Association representing America's pharmacy benefit companies. On average, pharmacy benefit companies are saving over $1,000 per person per year, which is savings that's delivered back to the plan sponsor and ultimately to the patient. The prescription drug marketplace works well for millions of patients who are able to access the medications they need at the cost that they expect, but there still are pockets of challenge around affordability. Unfortunately, the reality is that prescription drug prices oftentimes are high. We oftentimes see that around drugs where there just isn't enough competition, meaning one brand drug company owns the monopoly in a space and they can set and raise the price at will, which tells us that if we want to address the price of those drugs, we need more competition in the system. The drug company is the only entity that has the ability to set or raise the price. What we saw last year was drug manufacturers raise the price of drugs on over 1,200 products at higher than the rate of inflation. According to the Department of Health and Human Services, more than 1,200 prescription drugs rose in price faster than the rate of inflation last year. They have the ability to do that where competition doesn't exist to improve the patient experience, to improve affordability, but it all has to start with that foundational question of competition. When we look at the areas that there isn't enough competition, biologics is a, is a great example. Biologics are prescription drugs that are made from living organisms, different from the, the small molecule drugs that we're all familiar with, the pills that we take today. This is a new category of drugs in some ways, specialty drugs that account for over 50% of spending on prescription drugs in the United States, but really only are taken up by 2% of patients. One of the areas that holds promise is the introduction of biosimilars, which are equally effective therapeutic alternatives to the brand name Biologic. What we have seen are a number of barriers to entry, one of which is the patent system. There are instances where drug manufacturers are gaming that system to delay entry of competition. We are very encouraged that the Senate Judiciary Committee has started to move forward on a package of bills that would address tactics that have been used to take advantage of the patent system, evergreening, patent thickets. These tactics where manufacturers are filing multiple patents on different aspects of the same product to create a thicket, which creates this shield or barrier to entry of competition, or they're making small incremental changes to a product as a period of exclusivity starts to run out. And we would say that incremental change isn't actually making the product work any better for the patient, but it helps them reset the clock on a whole new period of monopoly. Those kind of tactics, which the Senate legislation is trying to get at by tightening up the system, are the kind of things that we need to do to truly unlock competition in the marketplace. Once you have that competition, the pharmacy benefit company can step in and leverage that competition to bring down the cost of the drug. It's the responsibility of every stakeholder in the supply chain to come forward with solutions to try and make that system work better for patients. It has to start at the root level with that issue of competition. PCMA has come forward with our own set of ideas, which at a foundational and fundamental level focus on issues of competition because that's where the price is set, that is where the, the cost is first determined. Those are the things we have to address at the get-go to make sure that the system is operating fairly so that there's a competitive environment for new products to get into the market. 
Unfortunately, we have seen a lot of finger pointing from other stakeholders in the prescription drug supply chain. For us, this is about putting solutions on the table that are gonna actually address affordability issues where they exist. We're taking a very holistic approach that addresses everything from that foundational question of competition all the way through improving the patient experience because America's pharmacy benefit companies are committed to an affordable future for patients. Now our panel will take a deep dive into some solutions to bring down prescription drug prices. I am now joined by Preeti Christel, a health justice lawyer and co-founder and co-executive director of IMAC. IMAC is a nonprofit that focuses on improving global access to vaccines and medicines by challenging drug patent monopolies. Alex Brill, an economist and founder and CEO of Matrix Global Advisors, an economic consulting firm. And Lauren Aronson, the executive director of the Campaign for Sustainable Drug Pricing. The campaign represents all parties in the drug pricing debate, minus the pharmaceutical voice. Welcome to y'all. Preeti, let me start with you. What do you believe is the problem uh, with drug patents in, in a way uh, that I would understand and uh, from 30,000 feet and, and our audience would understand? Because it's complicated, as you know. Sure, a patent is supposed to be a time-limited monopoly where if a company invents a drug and they file for a patent, they get 20 years of exclusivity. But unfortunately, what we've been seeing lately is that companies are filing for dozens or even hundreds of patents to extend their monopoly period in order to keep uh, their revenues, and that's blocking competition from the market. And what do you think should be, should be done? So what we're basically seeing right now is that there are seven out of 10 of the top selling drugs right now are supposed to go off patent in this decade. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing is that the companies are just trying to figure out how do I hold on to my revenue? And the answer that they found is to file more and more patents to build a thicket and block their competitors. We think that Congress really needs to tighten up the system to make sure that type of patenting behavior doesn't happen anymore. It starts with the agencies. We think that Congress can do a lot more to provide oversight of the agencies, bring more scrutiny to how examination is happening. Examination is basically the process where patent applications are reviewed before they're granted. But ultimately, Congress is going to have to tighten up the rules of what is worthy of a patent. Lauren, can you tell me just a little bit about what your group does in reducing uh, drug prices for consumers, uh, you know, kind of on a daily, short-term, long-term basis? Sure. Um, so our members represent, as you noted, everyone in the supply chain with the exception of the pharmaceutical manufacturers. So we represent physicians, nurses, seniors, patients, health plans, employers, and pharmacy benefit companies. So what unites our members though is really this focus on the role that manufacturers play in setting the price. And so when we're doing our advocacy, we are focusing on market-based solutions to bring down the cost of prescription drugs for patients um, and for um, consumers across the country. So we are focusing both on, on short-term issues um, and long-term issues as well. And so when we think about patent abuses, from, from our perspective, you know, to Preeti's point, really getting to making sure there are lower cost alternatives on the market is, is really the is, 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 is the I Ching of what we're trying to achieve here. And so I think in the short term, there's a lot that the administration is doing between coordination between the patent um, trade office and the FDA, um, as well as Congress. We've seen some bipartisan bills passed through the Senate Judiciary Committee recently to try to address these patent abuses that Preeti uh, noted. I, Lauren, you, you've worked for CMS, you've worked for the Ways and Means Committee and, and the White House. Uh, so that's a lot of perspectives working on healthcare. What, what, what did you learn and, and anything surprise you of, of the difficulty? It's never easy getting anything done in healthcare. Wow, uh, great question. Um, I will, you know, having worked in the Affordable Care Act when I was in the White House and then now working on, on drug pricing, they're, they're both very paramount. But I think my takeaway really is that, the, you know, the voice of patients, I think, is really critical in getting something achieved. And what we've seen is that the outrage over prescription drug pricing over the last several years has really forced Congress to act on something where, you know, many people have thought for for a very long time that the pharmaceutical 
um, manufacturers have really controlled Congress. And what we showed um, through the last several years is that you can make change. Um, it takes a long time and you can't let perfect be the enemy of good. But with every bill that passes, um, you know, we are we are incrementally making um, change and helping bring down the cost of prescription drugs. Alex, you, you and I, late last year, we talked about your experience in, in creating, uh, which was at the time the, the biggest uh, expansion of Medicare since its inception, uh, Part D. You talked about something that was not easy uh, to get done 20 years ago. Um, a 15-minute vote became a three-hour vote in the House, and, and, it, and it did help, I think, President Bush's reelection chances he ended up winning. Um, but they had to pass the bill, I think, in order for him to win. What were your takeaways uh, from that legislation, which you know was controversial, but it wasn't as costly as, as some, including CBO, said? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Bob. Um, well, I mean, I, I'll go back to something that Lauren mentioned a moment ago, which is the, the patient perspective. Um, or the consumer perspective or the voter perspective, um, uh, I think a lot of what was motivating um, the decision to bring uh, prescription drug benefit into, into Medicare to create Medicare Part D was a recognition um, by policymakers, by lawmakers, Democrats and Republicans, that, that there was a benefit uh, that was you know, the public was deserving and needing of here. Um, then the question became the how, right? And, the, and the how will that benefit be structured? Who, who will make the decisions, who will structure that benefit, who will set the prices. Um, uh, that was a, a, a relatively partisan uh, effort, um, not entirely. Um, Republicans were committed to, to harnessing market uh, power, market forces, market interests, and driving competition and, and, and creating that benefit and, and harnessing the, the, the private sector in, in delivering Medicare Part D. Um, you talked about the cost of that. The cost of that uh, at the time of the, of the development of legislation was was hard to know because we had never done this before. Um, and so you're doing something for the first time. It's hard to know how much it's going to cost. Um, what we've experienced afterwards is that in part, in large part, due to the positive role of generics and competition in the marketplace, the overall cost uh, turned out to be less than, than when uh, Alex, you mentioned uh, market, and, and uh, what what is the what is the biosimilar market? How is it evolving uh, in in the coming years? You think? Yeah, I mean the biosimilar market is a great example of of bringing uh, prices down in the prescription drug uh, market overall. Um, and there's really two conversations that that are happening together here. One is this question about what can we do to bring down drug prices? And the other is what can we, what can competition do to bring down drug prices? Senator Smith talked a lot about competition and she lot, talked a lot about um, other strategies that are not competition based uh, to address uh, drug prices or out of pocket costs for, for consumers. And, and all of those are tools and are strategies. The government can, can negotiate prices, the government can set prices or the market can work to, to drive this competition. Um, biosimilars are a market-based uh, uh, framework. They, they, the government plays a role here. They're approving these products. Um, they're facilitating this pathway. But um, biologic drugs are generally mo the most expensive drugs that we have. They can be incredibly expensive. That's in part because they're very hard to develop. Um, uh, it's in part because the manufacturers have monopolies and, they, and they're demanding high prices. When we create a, a competitive environment for a biosimilar, then we get the natural market-based competition forces, and what we see is prices fall. Prices fall not only for the biosimilar who comes into the market and, and sets their price lower than the, than the monopolists, but also the monopolists want to want to stay in the market themselves, and they're forced to bring down prices. Just as Preeti said earlier, um, the, the companies are interested in, the, in maximizing their own revenue. That's not a bad thing. That's just a fact. Uh, competition mm -hmm. makes that more difficult for them, uh, and, and biosimilars is uh, Preeti, you know, the pharmaceutical industry makes a case if, if you're going to clamp down too much, you're going to pass uh, what they say, are, you know, pricing controls. And when you're going to hurt R&D, that's going to hurt patients in the long run. Uh, what do you think of that argument? Yeah, I don't think anybody is talking about clamping down and stifling the industry's capacity to deliver for Americans. What we're talking about is in cases where there's clearly gaming of the system happening, those sort of end stage abuses. Now, I mentioned that seven out of 10 of America's top selling drugs are due to go off patent this decade. Five of those are biologics. 
And if you look at these top selling drugs, like, you know, drugs for arthritis, for example, or for cancer, we're seeing in specific cases like Humira, like Emberol, that Europeans are getting these drugs more affordably years earlier. And I think we have to ask the question of why. And that's where our research has shown that they're filing and getting many, many times more patents here than they are in Europe. They're asserting more of those patents in litigation here than they are in Europe. A lot of tactics that we allow here in the marketplace that ultimately are hurting Americans, and we're just asking for a right-sizing of the system. Let's just correct for some of those rules to make sure our market can stay healthy and competitive. Uh, Lauren, you mentioned that you were uh, you were in the White House as the Affordable Care Act was getting through. And uh, as you remember, and a lot of viewers remember, there was a deal struck with the pharmaceutical uh, industry to get on board. Can you talk about the kind of the delicate dance of, of striking deals? Uh, because in order to move controversial legislation, which almost all of healthcare is, you've got to strike uh, agreements in order to advance legislation. And what what do you think uh, policymakers can can learn from that? As you know, very exhausting experience. Yeah, I mean. I'd say a couple of things. I mean, one, anytime you're moving a major piece of legislation, particularly like the Affordable Care Act, every stakeholder in the healthcare industry, not just the pharmaceutical industry, um, you know, had reductions in, in the law. You know, hospitals had reductions, um, health plans did, and the pharmaceutical manufacturers did it too. Um, and the pharmaceutical manufacturer element of it was, was pretty significant. I mean, there were a number of policies um, that were included in the ACA that really, um, you know, helped to bring down the cost of prescription drugs and, and reduce the federal government's liability. Um, I think at the end of the day, when you're trying to move major pieces of legislation, you know, you always need to balance um, kind of what the goals are. And at that point, the goals aligned. Um, at that point, the, the industry wanted to help support coverage um, and, and coverage broadly in the private market um, and also recognize that they were part of the solution. It's unfortunate, though, that since the ACA passed, the industry has really taken a much different turn and are no longer part of the solution. They are now pointing the fingers at everyone else in the supply chain. Uh, Alex, uh, as far as you know, where health care has gone, you know, the, the Congress now is not going to be tackling, both Republicans and Democrats agree, uh, not going to be tackling entitlements, including Medicare reform. Um, but, you know, also talking to David Schweiker earlier in the program, uh, you know, Medicare is going bankrupt, Social Security is not as bad. But, but at some point, uh, this is going to have to happen. Are you optimistic that the parties which did get together in 1990s to change Medicare significantly as a bipartisan bill, and that was basically struck by Newt Gingrich and, and Bill Clinton. Are those days even possible anymore? Well, the, the near-term rhetoric uh, from both parties uh, doesn't give me a lot of uh, hope or optimism. We're hearing from both parties this notion um, that um, Medicare and Social Security is, quote-unquote, off the table. Um, it strikes me as odd, to be honest. Um, key provisions of, of the Inflation Reduction Act um, will reduce um, Medicare outlays. Um, that seems to be, those seem like Medicare provisions to me. Um, there seems to me that a strong, should be a strong desire to say to uh, constituents, to say to patients, we're going to bring down your health care costs. Uh, and that seems, and for those constituents and patients who are seniors, that seems to me to be touching Medicare. So the rhetoric is a little bit confusing to me, but, but, the, but the headlines are certainly that in the near term, um, those, those policies seem to be off the table. Ultimately, Congress will be forced to address these issues. Um, this is, these are not choices. Um, this, this will become a necessity uh, for, all, for all of our entitlement programs, Social Security and, and, and Medicare and, and others. They are on, they are on unsustainable paths. Mm -hmm. um, and and structural changes will be required. Um, uh, to some extent, those changes could be uh, implemented over time and could, could capture uh, the power and forces of markets to drive competition to bring down lower prices, or Congress could choose to wait and, and, and be forced to make more painful choices in, in shorter periods of time. I don't know. It doesn't seem like they're going to make the right choice in the near term, but there is, you know, there's, a, there's always hope. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lauren, can you describe patent thickets? Uh, it, that's a complicated issue, but what, what are, what, what's the role of patent thick, thickets as far as reducing prescription drug prices? 
Sure. So when we, and I'm sure you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but you have a situation where a drug comes to market, um, they get their 20 years of, of approval. And then from there, what you're seeing is that manufacturers then basically create what's sort of like a patent fortress where they file multiple patents. In the case of Humira, I believe it's like 247 um, mm -hmm. patents that were then filed on one specific drug. And they may be for things like you know, small modifications such as a color change or a formulation change. You have a lot of duplicative patent patents that are are done too, where they may say it's no longer five days, but it's seven days, and that then restarts the patent clock. Um, and so every time that you want to have a generic or a biosimilar, then try to bring a lower cost alternative to market, they have to then go and challenge every single one of those patents. So patent thicketing or sort of like a patent fortress is basically a way for the brand name manufacturers just to protect um, their market share. And it really comes as a, a massive detriment to consumers. Um, you know, free up and, and Ovik Roy and his organization did a study last year that found, you know, patients paid over $5 billion more than they needed to out of pocket just because of things like patent abuses. And so as we're thinking about the impact on consumers, when patent thickets are formed to prevent lower cost alternatives from coming to market, that has a real impact on patients and on taxpayers. Uh, Preeti, uh, as far as you know, this, the Biden administration and prior administrations, when they've struggled to get legislation through Congress and to the president's desk, they uh, tackle problems administratively uh, through regulation. We've seen that with climate change, uh, student loan issues, which is now before the Supreme Court was done administratively. Um, wh what would you like to see? You know, I haven't heard a lot about uh, what what the Biden administration could do in a big picture that doesn't have to get through Congress, because as you know, we're we're in divided uh, government right now. And it's going to be very difficult to get anything on, on health care, at least anything big done in this Congress. So this administration took an important step early on through the executive order for competition, uh, specifically naming uh, the patent system as a lever that needs to get addressed. Um, in order to promote competition. And under that executive order, um, and this is pretty historic, I know these technical uh, fixes can also you know, seem a little abstract, but it is pretty historic that under this administration and this executive order, uh, the U.S. Patent Office and the U.S. FDA are working together in a more concerted way for the first time. And together, they have the opportunity to really understand where in the rules, where in the system are patents slipping through the cracks that are actually delaying competition to market and hurting patients and families. So I think this is an important first step that the administration has taken. It is a pretty neutral change, but one that I hope will survive through administration so that these agencies that are tasked with overseeing different aspects of medicines will keep working together to raise the bar of what is worthy of a patent. Lauren, let, let's take it down to the, the consumer level. When, when just kind of a simple question, but an important one, uh, and and I want to get to this because this is this is kind of the crux of the issue is that when you have high prescription drug prices, how does that affect society? How does that affect everyday uh, Americans? Uh, on if they if they're if they can't afford uh, prescription drug prices, what what can they do? Right. I mean, it's a great question, Bob, and it is the reason why we've been having this debate for so long. Um, you know, we've seen, you know, when drugs came to market in the late 80s to massive public outcry, it was around eight or nine thousand dollars. And now we're seeing new drugs come to market that have, you know, millions of dollars. And we all want new innovative drugs to come to market. And we need to balance that um, innovation with affordability. But you're absolutely right. If, you know, with these all these rising drug prices, you know, families are, are forced to choose between groceries, um, you know, uh, elements of, of paying for you know, child care, um, education. And so it has a real impact. Um, I think Congress has done a lot here to move the ball forward. And so has the administration to previous point, but obviously more needs to be done. But for, you know, a patient, when you're looking at, you know, you're at the pharmacy counter, it, it is a real challenge when you're seeing what manufacturers are charging. You know, a lot of people say, you know, we would never have the, the health care system we have now, which is employer based. And Alex, I know your former boss, Bill Thomas, uh, chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, kind of thought about uh, decoupling them. But that was very difficult to do. And, and, and he knew that. You know, we, we're talking a lot about the role of government, but what about the role of non-government? Whether, you know, the healthcare system is dealing with stakeholders, a lot of them point the fingers at one another saying, it's not my fault, it's their fault. Um, but outside of government, what, what do you think outside stakeholders could do to, 
you know, get to the point where there can be some agreement uh, because, as we discussed earlier, you know, the healthcare system is not sustainable as, as it is right now, and there are going to have to be radical changes or at least fundamental changes, uh, maybe not effective tomorrow, but effective uh, down the road. Yeah, I think the, the, the role of, non, of non-government organizations, entities, employers, individuals, um, stakeholders is, is really critical here. I think one of the things that makes this difficult is that the, the right answer is not in either corner of the extreme, right? What we're trying to do is we're trying to balance multiple objectives, we're trying to preserve a market where innovative drug companies want to and can and are rewarded for their innovation. Right? We want to have that. We want to have the new drugs that we have. And we also want to balance that against the desire to make sure that those products are accessible and are available. Now, obviously, the manufacturers themselves also want their products to be accessible. They can't, they can't make any revenues if they can't find customers for their products. But we need to find a way for that, that accessibility to maximize um, the, the, the benefit for the, for the market as a whole, not the benefit only for the, the patent holders. And that's where that's where this challenge and this balancing act uh, comes to play, um, and it's where I think there's an opportunity for competition to help um, create that balance, right? And so we have a framework, broadly speaking. I mean, and Preeta is exactly right. We're not talking about uh, you know ending the, the patent system or something like that. We need to protect the patent system, I would say, but we need to think about the abuses, about the the unintended consequences, um, and those. Uh, strategies that are being deployed that are hindering competition and thereby limiting a, a really important public benefit, the benefits that accrue from competition, the benefits that accrue from multiple generics entering the market and driving prices way down, the benefits that accrue from multiple biosimilars uh, entering the market. And the last thing I would say is, you know, yes, there are really high headline prices for, for a number of drugs, um, and there are individuals who are really uh, st- stuck and struck by the cost that they, their, their own out-of-pocket um, pays, individuals who are uninsured or, are another, or, or underinsured in certain circumstances. We also need to keep our eyes on the, on the bigger, broader picture about healthcare spending generally, recognizing that you know, the majority of dollars that are being spent in healthcare are not pharmaceutical dollars, right? They're, su- they're dollars that are going in other parts of the healthcare system. 10, 11, 12% of the of healthcare spending is drug spending. We should think about promoting competition in that market. We should also think about promoting competition in the rest of the healthcare system, and that has to do with others, other providers and other. Well, we are out of time. We packed a lot in that half an hour. I, I want to thank our panel. Thank you, Preeti Christel, Alex Brill, and Lauren Aronson for joining us today. Pleasure. And that brings us to the end of our program. A big thank you to PCMA, the Pharmaceutical Care Management Association, and to all of you for watching. For those who missed any of these conversations this morning, we will have the video up from the event on our website, thehill.com, shortly. I'm Bob Cusack. Have a great rest of your day.